Please welcome Eric Zimmerman, and thank you so much for coming back to the NJTPA today. Absolutely, thank you so much for having me here. I hope uh, I hope everybody can see my slides okay, if I could get a, a word that that's the case. Yes, I can see it. Excellent, thank you very much. Well, thanks, thanks so much for having me. I do see uh, a lot of familiar faces and names, and it's uh, a pleasure to be with you, even if virtually in these uh, in these strange times. Uh, if, for those that are on that might not know who NARC is, uh, we are an association of uh, metropolitan and regional planning organizations from across the country. Um, many of our members uh, work on transportation, uh, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. I also work on a, a wide variety of other topics, uh, economic development, uh, resiliency, uh, environmental initiatives, and, and the like. Um, and uh, uh, so we, we represent them in Washington, both to Congress and uh, and uh, in administrative matters. Uh, and so I'm here to talk to you a little bit about uh, what we're seeing uh, in Washington, especially on the legislative front. Uh, and the best way I came up to describe what's going on right now in Washington is uh, sort of a, a swirl. And I do want to clarify, uh, that this is not the toilet bowl kind of swirl that I'm talking about. Uh, this is more of the beautiful tapestry of colors coming together to form what we hope is a beautiful palette. But since we are talking about Washington, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd best clarify that. Um, and into that swirl, there are a number of things uh, that are coming together that are making uh, right now a very interesting time in terms of policy. Um, obviously, uh, the, the biggest among them is uh, COVID and, and the response to COVID. Uh, including uh, uh, economic uh, recovery. Um, we also obviously have a new administration, a change in the control of the of the U.S. Senate. Um, for uh, purposes of transportation, we have uh, Fast Act is being uh, is expiring in in uh, September. We have a new rock star DOT secretary uh, for perhaps the first time ever. Uh, earmarks, reconciliation. These are all the things that are sort of swirling around right now uh, that are important. Uh, background to what is going on in Washington and what we expect here over, over the coming months. So let me take a little bit of a deeper dive into some of those and, and give you a little perspective on, on what I'm saying. Um, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the administration's principles, and then we'll talk about the three major pieces of legislation uh, that are currently uh, under consideration or, or uh, we expect here in the future. So uh, as mentioned, um, COVID uh, remains at the very top of the list and I think closely aligned with economic recovery um, as, as important principles for the new administration. But then I think also equity and climate, and you could probably come up with a few others, are also uh, very high on that list and I think speak quite a bit to uh, how legislation will be shaped here uh, in the near term and the longer term. And so I think are important to keep in mind uh, as we're talking about uh, legislation in Washington. Uh, I won't spend too much time on the COVID response package. Uh, I think folks are probably aware that this bill uh, is now back uh, in the House hands. Uh, this is being done through a process called reconciliation, uh, which are uh, elements related to uh, the budget and spending um, and allows for passage by a simple majority and it's especially important in the Senate. Uh, the Senate over the weekend passed uh, its version of the bill after making some changes to the House version. Uh, and we do expect the House uh, will sign, uh, will pass that bill uh, perhaps as early as tomorrow and send it to uh, the president's desk for signature. Um, this, of course, is a very important bill uh, for a number of reasons, um, chief among them that it provides quite a bit of funding for state and local initiatives, which I know are important for, for many of you. Um, but from a transportation perspective, it's a little bit, uh, it, there, there isn't quite as much in this one as we expect in some other legislation. There is some money for transit, there another $30.5 billion dollars uh, for transit, uh, and and you can see another smattering Amtrak gets some some additional funding. Um, no money for highways and, and bridges and the like, uh, but uh, that will come in we expect in future legislation. Uh, as I said, this is uh, expected to be taken up uh, tomorrow with a a, 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 a self-imposed deadline of March 14th, which is when unemployment uh, insurance uh, expires. And so we do expect that this bill does appear likely to be headed for passage and signature before that point. But I think what's perhaps more interesting for, for the purposes of today's conversation are the other two pieces of legislation. And that includes uh, first the COVID uh, recovery package. Um, and what we expect from this bill is, is uh, more of a sort of medium term approach. This will take a little bit longer to come together 
uh, than some, some of the immediate response uh, re, uh, legislation. The most likely path here, I, I do think, is through uh, this, a similar reconciliation type uh, approach. Um, I will put a caveat on that over the weekend. Uh, Senator Manchin has indicated that he does not anticipate allowing, since he is sort of the deciding vote or the sort of middle vote in the Senate, um, he does not anticipate supporting a bill uh, for infrastructure that uh, is uh, through reconciliation. So that remains something to keep an eye on. Uh, and we'll see uh, how that shapes up. But that I still do think that the most likely path to getting uh, an investment uh, of this type done is through is through uh, reconciliation. Um, the size of the bill is still unclear. Uh, we've heard indications from one to three trillion dollars. And as I mentioned, uh, there have been every indication that infrastructure is going to be at the center of this uh, this bill. Uh, infrastructure sort of writ large. I mean, it's roads, bridges, broadband. Uh, transit, but also power sector, buildings, housing, uh, perhaps. Uh, and so uh, there are a lot of opportunities within this uh, for uh, in, in a lot of directions. Um, and one thing that's going on in Washington, I think it's, uh, it's, it's good to hear a little bit about is that there seems to be a bit of a blurred line uh, in the discussions uh, as we're talking about this, these bills between this sort of infrastructure package uh, reconciliation approach, and then the reauthorization of the uh, of the transportation program. Um, they're kind of being talked about as though they're the same thing, but they really aren't. Uh, and in part because we expect the infrastructure side of, of legislation, if it is done through reconciliation, the reconciliation process is one where you really can't create new policy um, through that process. And so I really that really means that if we were to try and do reauthorization through a process like that, it would not be like any reauthorization we've ever seen. It would not be a traditional reauthorization of the program. Um, and because uh, the anything that's in a reconciliation bill has to have a budgetary impact, it has to have a congressional budget office score. In other words, it has to increase the debt over a certain period of time. Um, it's really uh, pretty challenging to see them doing a gas tax increase or even a transfer of funding into the Highway Trust Fund, which desperately needs it and will need an infusion in order to get uh, the next reauthorization done. Um, but because those don't actually score, they're seen as intergovernmental transfers. This isn't really the, the place where we're going to see that get done either. Um, and so I think this blurring is interesting. I think it speaks to the fact that there's a hope that some part of what they're about to do is going to go through a uh, a bipartisan process, which I think the reauthorization bill would do that. Um, and, and sort of, so they blend, sort of blend it in with this other reconciliation infrastructure package. And then we'll see uh, as this process plays out, what comes, what comes out of that. But through reconciliation, what you really have an opportunity to do is create, uh, is support existing programs, which is important. There are a lot of things that we could plus up, things like the surface tra transportation block grant program, where a lot of local funds are are distributed for transportation, uh, high-speed rail, um, you know, things like that. Existing programs are are much easier to plus up in a reconciliation package. They already exist. The policy has already been created. And you can just put additional resources into those uh, going forward. We'll see how this all plays out. There's going to be political pressure both from uh, a uh, whether this can be bipartisan in any way. It's going to be important. There also could be uh, some political pressure from both sides of the Democratic caucus. Uh, that that will be interesting to watch as as we uh, proceed here as well. So then the second piece of legislation that we have our eye on uh, is, of course, the FAST Act reauthorization. Um, this is a more of a medium to long term pursuit. Um, you know, it really does depend on what happens with uh, an infrastructure package. If that happens, uh, then this probably gets pushed off even a little bit further, depending on how they how they do that. The most likely path to something like this occurring is through regular order, uh, where you have to have a bill uh, that would get 60 votes in the Senate. Um, we do have a deadline on this one in that the FAST Act does expire at the end of September of this year. Um, so something needs to happen by then, whether that's a, an extension, which we've seen many of those in the past, uh, or they're able to get something done. Um, uh, uh, that you know, But something will have to happen by then to keep the program operating. Um, but, uh, leaders in both chambers have indicated a very fast process, at least at the outset, um, because there's sort of this melding of infrastructure uh, and, and reauthorization at the moment. Uh, everything is sort of moving at the same time. And so leaders from both chambers have said that they want uh, a bill done in, in fairly short order. 
Um, of course, a fast process, at least initially, does not a guarantee uh, a fast outcome. And that's really what is most important is that something gets across the finish line. And so we'll see how that how that goes. The House bill, um, the, if, if folks remember last session, the House did pass a, uh, a, a reauthorization proposal. It got rolled up into a larger infrastructure package uh, that did pass the House, didn't go anywhere in the Senate. Um, but uh, we do expect that that House reauthorization bill will largely stay the same. There might be some changes and tweaks um, to match uh, uh, the new administration's priorities, but largely that bill, I think the form, the form of it will stay largely the same. Uh, Mr. DeFazio indicated last week he plans to reinstitute earmarks as part of reauthorization. I'll talk a little bit more detail on that in just a moment. Um, and the Senate bill, uh, which the Senate also, uh, at least the committee also passed uh, legislation last session on a bipartisan basis, had uh, unanimous support in, in the committee. Um, and of course, now the Senate has flipped. There's a new uh, chairman in place. Um, and so there is going to be a certain rewriting of that bill, though, uh, you know, you still have, say, 90 senators remain the same in that chamber. And so you, you aren't going to get wholesale changes probably to that bill, but there will be, again, addition of certain uh, things to, to match uh, the administration's priorities. Um, and one area that we've heard is a potential for uh, improvement is actually the provision of local funding. So finding a way to make sure that we are maximizing the funds that are flowing down to the local level for prioritization on projects uh, through, through MPOs. Uh, and so we'll continue to work with the Senate to, to push that forward. Um, and we do know that they are asking now from senators for their priorities. So if you have anything that you want to reach out to your senator, your senators about um, now would be the time to do that as they are collecting priorities now for that for that upcoming bill. So our priorities on FAST Act remain largely the same as they did last session, and that's primarily to increase money that flows to locals through their MPO. Um, we we are encouraging that in in uh, a couple of ways. First is through the program I mentioned earlier, the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program. This is the one program that really sends substantial funds both through surface, the, the SDP portion and through the TAP, the Transportation Alternatives Program funding. Um, that really is the funds that get down to the local level for your prioritization onto projects. And then the other is PL, the Metropolitan Planning Funding. Um, we're calling for a, a market increase in funding through PL. This is, of course, as you all know, the, the keep the lights on dollars that flow down uh, to allow the MPO to operate. Um, we work in coalition on many of these uh, items with local officials and transportation coalition, which is the League of Cities, the National Association of Counties, the Conference of Mayors, the Association of MPOs, and the National Association of Development Organizations. And altogether, um, we have been pushing recently um, to, to ask Congress to consider actually making uh, STBG 100% suballocated, so all of the funding into that program flows through the uh, population breakdowns that, that occur there. Um, and and uh, that would definitely dramatically increase the amount of funding available at the local level, especially for areas over 200,000 who get to make decisions about where those funds are, are spent most directly. Um, you know, that would be a, a market increase in funding uh, for those areas. And so, um, you know, we'd love, uh, certainly love for you to tell Congress how you would use uh, these increases in funds um, and how important this would be uh, for local, uh, lo you know, making things move at the local level. Um, there are already some action occurring on this. this. The House in its bill last year increased the provision of suballocation, which is the percentage of funds that flows through local areas by population. Um, they, they had a, an increase in their bill from 55% up to 60%. Um, Mrs. Brownlee from California has a bill that would increase that to 65%. Uh, and of course, as I said, we're trying to start a conversation about considering uh, the increase to to 100%. Um, in this day and age, when there are a lot of uncertainties, local areas have a lot of things that they're working on uh, in, in the face of uh, economic uncertainty. Um, and really, there's this marked change in um, things like resilience and things like uh, working on, on climate related initiatives, where it's really the action is gonna happen at the local level. And that's where we, we think change can be best effectuated. And, and so uh, providing additional funding through the transportation program to local areas is really important uh, in, in the face of some of those challenges. 
So a quick note about earmarks. Uh, as it says, earmarks are back, baby. And then I caveated that with a maybe. Um, but there is a process in place. Um, there, we knew that there was agreement between the appropriations leaders in uh, the House and Senate to move on appropriations earmarks. And now we got word last week and a dear colleague from Mr. DeFazio to the TNI committee um, that they will be collecting projects for earmarking. Two of the big changes that they're proposing that I uh, are, are a little different from years past and I think are important changes. Um, first, that pro any project that would qualify for an earmark has to appear on a regional tip or a, a, a state step. Um, we've gotten a lot of feedback uh, on this um, from NJTPA and others indicating that perhaps uh, we need to encourage them to expand the list of places where they might take projects from to include a uh, long range plan, to include perhaps the, the unified work program, um, maybe even the SEDS, the, the um, development uh, plan, if, if folks receive EDA funding, um, that all of these are, are important areas because the TIP and STIP is already funded. And so there are projects that don't appear there um, that are perhaps the type of projects that, that communities would like to see earmarked, perhaps active transportation programs. There's, I think, a few categories like that. And so expanding the list out of where folks might draw projects from would be important. The other uh, important change is that um, earmarks could now support, and, and the earmarks always could, but to get away from this idea of shovel ready as the only way to gauge a project's funding worthiness, um, earmarks can support any project phase. Um, and so it's not just things that are automatically going to be ready to move tomorrow. It's also going to uh, potentially fund phases of projects that are leading up toward construction, but before they're ready for, for that construction for, uh, phase. Um, there's still a lot we don't know here. Um, the timing, I, I do think this is going to be a fast process um, where they're going to start asking for projects and there's going to be like a month that they have to get those projects in and then they're going to close that list off. Um, the amount of funding uh, that will be earmarked and the sources of that funding within the program are also a question. You've got pro programs like the, the um, projects of national and regional, uh, regional and national significance that might be prime for earmarking. There's a few others, but we're not exactly sure what those are going to look like yet. And then there's finally the question of whether the Republicans are going to go along, uh, whether the Senate would go along, Senate Democrats would go along with House Democrats on this. So there's still quite a few questions uh, before we get to an endpoint on this, but uh, the question has been raised, and I do think we're going to see, uh, at the very least, this process is kicking off in the House, and we'll see where that carries us uh, going forward. Um, and of course, no uh, conversation with folks in New Jersey would be complete without a, at least a, a little bit of a nod to the Gateway Program. Um, as the chairwoman indicated early on, she sees optimism, uh, and I think she was talking a little bit more broadly, but I think there's also reason to believe that there could be some uh, optimism for, for the Gateway program as well, um, with some important factors pointing to potential future success. Um, as I'm sure folks are aware, the Federal Transit Administration recently reversed its prohibition on the local uh, on local areas using loan funds that they themselves will be repaying as matching funds. Those can now again be used as matching funds as they always had been before uh, the Trump administration uh, reversed that. Uh, and so that has has certainly shifted um, the the funding outlook uh, to a great extent. Um, I, last year's uh, House Invest Act, which was that broad infrastructure program, also had uh, ten billion dollars for projects of region, uh, national and regional significance. And at least Congressman Sirius and probably others uh, certainly read this in a release as a source of funding for Gateway. Um, was very confident that this would be used at least in part to to fund elements of the Gateway program. Um, and I would say similar, um, you know, earmarks would probably be a good place to uh, secure additional support, depending on what programs uh, they use to, to fund those that, that earmark approach. Um, the Senate flip certainly uh, helps things um, with uh, with Senator Schumer now, the majority uh, the the leader in the in the Senate. Um, and I and I feel like this pro program, the gateway program in, in large is sort of tailor made for infrastructure and reconciliation. There are. I think a number of, of programs that it would be possible to put significant funding into and make it pretty clear where that funding is intended to end up uh, working working on the on the especially the tunnels. Um, so I, I do think that there is uh, there is the that that positive outlook is is well warranted. I think especially on gateway. So the the too long didn't read version of all of this. 
Um, we're really focusing on the next stimulus bill and reauthorization. Uh, and that as we keep in mind the priorities of the, of the Biden administration, I think there's an opportunity both within transportation and outside of transportation. There's just a whole host of, of new things that we might see significant increases in funding and attention, funding for and attention on workforce, EV charging, electrification, automated vehicles, housing, uh, equity, broadband, resilience. I think the list is probably even quite a bit longer than that. But those are some of the, the real highlights and, and the ones that I think uh, our members are, are sort of most interested in. So we'll be keeping an eye on that, finding a way to help provide some, some feedback on ways to structure this program to support these things that our, our members work on uh, through these bills. Um, and so that is that is my view of things from Washington right now. I'm always happy to hear feedback and, and learn what, what folks are thinking about it, if you have any thoughts. But uh, I